Good afternoon. It's situated here. Let me start with some opening remarks. Over the last week, the Sudanese Rapid Support Forces has carried out a major and brutal attack across eastern part of the Al Jazeera state in Sudan, located just to the south of Khartoum. They attacked multiple villages in the area, deliberately targeting civilians. Many of the RSF's victims have been children and women. The United States condemns these attacks in the strongest terms and calls on the RSF to halt violence against civilians immediately. The group's leaders have repeatedly committed to their obligation to civilian protection under international humanitarian law, and they must uphold those commitments. The United States recently imposed sanctions on Algoni Hamdan Daglo Musa for his role in RSF atrocities, and we will continue to impose costs on all those committing and fueling these atrocities. These heinous attacks are sadly only the latest in a war that has gone on for far too long. Attacks like these exacerbate the severe hunger and displacement crisis that has put more than 25 million Sudanese in need of emergency humanitarian relief and forced more than 14 million people to flee their homes since the conflict began. Our support for the Sudanese people is steadfast as they demand a sustainable end to the conflict and worked uh, to develop a process to resume the stalled political transition to inclusive, civilian-led democratic governance. That, Matt. Great. Uh, well, not great, but I mean, not great at Understood. all. Understood, yeah. That, sorry. That. Understood. Um, I, just before we get into the Middle East, I, ju I just wanted to ask you if you've got an answer to my question about the Cuba vote, the UN. I know there's going to be a vote today. I don't believe it's happened yet. It's occurring this afternoon. Yes. So, oh, what was your well, question? How we will vote? We yeah. will vote no. But uh, you will vote no. Will vote and have no. you lined up anyone? As I said, to, as, I previewed, um, other, as I previewed yesterday, it was likely. I didn't think we were going to vote on, okay, uh, for a resolution condemning fine. ourselves. And in but, fact, but we will vote no. Have you lined up anyone to vote with you? Uh, I think I'll wait until we see the vote uh, results to talk about the outcome. So no, you're not sure if you'll get. I would one not ex or two others. I would not expect an outcome. Uh, Dissimilar. Dissimilar. I was going to say inconsistent. Dissimilar is a better word than to previous outcomes. This In other a, words, this is a resolution. Another demonstration of the entire, virtually the entire world's opposition to this, to the uh, embargo. Right? I wouldn't expect a dissimilar result, uh, but we have made our position right. clear on it for, for some time and we'll continue in our vote at the UN today. All right. Uh, to um, to um, the Middle East. Uh, uh, yesterday at the briefing, shortly before the Knesset voted on these two bills, uh, that deal with UNRWA, you s once again reiterated uh, the U.S. position yeah. that they shouldn't do it and uh, that they the law shouldn't be passed and that if they were, um, there should be steps taken to mitigate the situation. So now that the laws have both passed and recognizing that they won't take effect for another two months or so, uh, at least, uh, what is your response and what are you uh, planning to do, particularly given the emphasis that that you guys, the Secretary Blinken yep. and Secretary Austin in particular, have put on I improving the aid um, supply into, into Gaza? Yeah. Let me start by um, just reiterating that we are deeply troubled by this legislation. Uh, it could shutter utter op UNRWA operations in the West Bank, uh, in Gaza, in East Jerusalem. It poses risks for millions of Palestinians who rely on UNRWA for essential services, including health care uh, and primary and secondary education. Uh, UNRWA, of course, plays a critical role in providing services to Palestinians in Gaza, the West Bank, and throughout the broader, the wider region, and particularly in Gaza, they play a role right now that at least today cannot be filled by anyone else. They are a key a partner in delivering food, water, and other humanitarian assistance to civilians in Gaza that wouldn't have anyone else to get it from if UNRWA were to go away. So we have made clear our concerns uh, over this bill. We have made clear our opposition to this bill. Um, as the secretary said in his letter, and as I reiterated yesterday, there could be consequences under U.S. law and U.S. policy for the implementation of this legislation. We are going to engage with the government of Israel in the days ahead about 
how they plan to implement, Im implement it. We're going to watch and see if there are legal challenges to the law and if there's any impact uh, uh, by those legal challenges. And then we'll, we'll make our decisions um, uh, after looking at all of those factors. All right. I'll let others go. Can I, can I follow up with each one? Um, just, just, I, I can't let you go without comment. That was a fantastic show oh, before, we, before, we, uh, before we get going. It's great. Sure. Bought from Angola, so anybody on the uh, British trip. I, I figured so. you got that on the trip that we were on, so it's great. Well, it's, Africa's a, a fashion powerhouse. Um, um, can I just, uh, no, seriously, can I ask you about, uh, back on uh, UNRWA, the, um, uh, the Norwegian government today said that it's going to go to the International Court of Justice. Um, See if Israel has actually legal obligations to let in uh, to, to let in aid, and specifically in the the, uh, the context of UNRWA. Does the U.S. have any comment on on, on that move by the Norwegians and, and the ICJ? I, I don't have any comment on that move, but it, they certainly have a legal obligation to allow humanitarian assistance in and not to erect roadblocks to humanitarian assistance to people in Gaza. And we have made that clear since the outset of this conflict. And uh, a great number of our engagements with the government of Israel have been around ensuring that they do let humanitarian assistance in and that they do ensure that humanitarian assistance gets to the people that need it. And that is precisely one of our major concerns about this legislation. I, I should be clear, by the way, it's not our only concern about this legislation. We also support the work that UNRWA does outside of Gaza. We support the, the work they do in uh, the West Bank. We support the work that they do in the broader region to deliver humanitarian services to Palestinians. But the work is absolutely critical and irreplaceable in Gaza right now. And we have made clear, we made clear before the passage of this legislation, and it remains true, that there are policy, potential policy and legal implications to this legislation being implemented, and we're going to be in conversation with the government of Israel about that. Sure. Um, maybe just stepping away from the UNRWA, per se. The, um, I wonder if you have anything to say about the Israeli strikes today in Gaza. Um, I think the, la the latest death hold that we've reported is nearly 100. By eyewitness accounts, uh, many, if not most, appear to be civilians, uh, children. Uh, I know you don't speak for the government of Israel, but as, as Israel's yeah. ally, do you have anything to say about this? Um, we are deeply concerned by the loss of civilian life in this incident. Uh, this was a horrifying incident with a horrifying result. Uh, I can't speak to the total death toll, but there are reports of two dozen children killed in this incident. No doubt a number of them are children who have been fleeing the effects of this war for more than a year now. We have reached out to the government of Israel to ask what happened here. Uh, we don't yet know the underlying circumstances. We have not gotten uh, a full explanation from them about what happened. But you step back and look at where we are in this campaign. We are a year into the government of Israel's military campaign in Gaza. And Israel has decimated Hamas's military ca capabilities. It has decimated Hamas's leadership. It has, through its military action, ensured that Hamas does not have the ability to repeat the attacks of October 7th. And all of that getting to here came at great cost to civilians in Gaza, which is, of course, often the case when civilians are caught in the crossfire in conflict. And so that tragic cost to civilians continues today, quite notably in this strike, which seems to have claimed significant civilian life. And it is a, another reminder of why we need to see an end to this war. And so why we need to see, I mean, the Secretary himself also said last, last week that he thinks that Israel, that Israel's strategic goals have largely been met. I mean, so why actually be why carry out strikes like this, and what's the utility at this point? So you have to take that question to the government of Israel. So I, I will say that, that, as the secretary said, yes, their, their strategic goals have largely been met. Now, there is a, a strategic goal that remains incredibly important, and that is to return all of the hostages. But as you have heard any number of leaders in our government speak to for some time, from the president to Secretary Blinken to Secretary of Defense Austin, it is crit critically important, not just to the people of Gaza, but to, Isra to Israelis and to Israel's own security, that Israel be mindful of achieving larger security. Or, or that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that Israel be mindful of achieving a larger strategic success. And 
that they be mindful of finding a way to end this campaign in a way that brings the hostages home and in a way that ensures their security and not just continuing in an endless perpetual conflict. Just one more, I mean, this has obviously been something you've been asked many times uh, yeah. over the past year, but uh, what is the U.S. going to do about it? I mean, the U.S. is obviously the major arms supplier to Israel, the major diplomatic supporter of Israel. We said that this incident is, is horrifying, and while you're trying to address and, and try to find out more information, uh, what would be the consequences, if any, if, it, if the U.S. feels that this was uh, without, without warrant? Uh, it's hard to say it's justified in any case, but if the U.S. decides that this was, um, this was, was what it was. Look, so not to get ahead of things, but you know when it comes to assessing any one individual strike, it's something that we have to be very deliberate about and take time to assess the, the underlying circumstances to decide whether there was any particular um, uh, potential legal violation and what the implications of that would be. I, I will say what we are going to do about it, though, is to continue to try and end the war and continue to impress upon to the government of Israel the need to end this war, the, to continue to work with the other mediators, uh, Egypt and Qatar, to try and find a way forward to end this war, and to continue to work with partners throughout the region and throughout the world to present a plan for what follows the war, which would give Israel the confidence that they don't need to continue an endless fight, that there would be actual security in Gaza that would provide security for Israel too, and so that they can withdraw their forces from Israel and know that there isn't an ongoing uh, threat to Israeli civilians and to the state of Israel. Sorry, Shannon, go ahead. I'm going to be next. I'm just going to go down the line, although then I've skipped Sorry. Jillian. So I've skipped Jillian. Sorry. <laughs> Having promised Shannon Humer, I'll do Shannon Humer and then Jillian. <laughs> Going back to the letter sent by Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin to the Israeli government, it calls for the creation of a virtual channel to discuss civilian harm incidents and says the first virtual meeting of that channel should take place before the end of October. Has it happened yet or is it on the books? Uh, we have had conversations about the establishment of that channel. I don't have anything definitive yet to report. We continue to have conversations about how to, how to establish that in a way that will be meaningful and will actually produce results. Does the State Department consider that meeting or its equivalent? to have taken place already. I don't have an announcement to make today. Um, uh, we have a few days left in the month. Yeah. Matt, so on that letter, um, I think that was sent about uh, more than two weeks ago. Does the United States have some sort of an interim assessment on um, how Israel has done so far in terms of fulfilling um, U.S. requirements, so, given what's going on in Northern So Gaza we have been watching and engaging with them about each of the steps that we called on them to implement in that letter. Now, I'm not, during this 30-day period, going to go through line by line and say which one has been implemented and which one has not, although we are very carefully tracking that. And we are engaging with them about specific steps that we want to see them take. But I don't think it's appropriate for me, while we're going through this process, to go through one by one and, and talk about where they are. Um, just speaking largely, though, or speaking broadly, I should say, we have seen some progress, but we haven't seen enough. Uh, that's why I said uh, last week, it can, what the Secretary said last week, it continues to be the case that we have seen them take some initial steps, but we need to see them do much more, and we are engaged with them to impress upon them the importance of doing much, much more. Right. Given it's another two weeks left, I believe, how confident that you know, are you that they are actually going to um, uh, fulfill these? I, I don't think it's um, appropriate for me to make any predictions at this point. We made clear what the steps are we want to see implemented. We put a deadline on it. Let's wait until we get to the deadline to talk about how, where things stand. Right. And about this deadline, um, there is a lot of commentary out there. And in the law, there is no grace period. Um, you are saying at this moment in time that you have not seen enough from Israel. So. I just want to ask the question that a lot of people out there are asking, why not implement the law now? We are implementing the law. We have not assessed them to be in violation of the law at this point. But you we, just, uh, you're, uh, you're just saying they're, they're not fulfilling the things that you want from them. That, correct, I mean, they correct. are impeding aid into Gaza. That, that, is, that is not what I said. We have, they're not they, impeding aid. That is not what I said. They have, they, we have outlined a number of steps that we want to see them take in the letter. Right. now. To answer your question, the reason why we didn't set oh, an immediate deadline or you, know, you have to implement all these steps five minutes after you get the letter or you have to implement all these steps seven days after the letter 
is because there are some of the steps that we understand take actual time to implement. If you sure, look at some of the, oh, just me, yeah, but we, we thought that 30 days was an appropriate measure, not two weeks, so we would put two weeks in the letter. There were some things that we wanted to see happen immediately, and we saw some of those happen immediately. We saw ERAs reopen immediately. We saw the Jordan route op reopen immediately, and the letter made clear some things we want to see happen immediately, and then we need to see other things happen within 30 days. We're not yet at 30 days. I promise you we will have uh, an extensive conversation about this at the end of that 30-day period, but we're in that window now. I just, okay, but I, I, I'm just having trouble understanding how the two things um, add up, and that is um, the Secretary has said, you've said whatever Israel was doing um, to ensure more aid goes into Gaza, that has fallen off significantly. There hasn't been a sustained effort, and they have not been doing enough for a sustained period of time. How, is, how does that not mean that they are impeding, they're not impeding aid? Like, we, how can those two things we have be not true at the same because time? We have not judged them to have, have so act, hold on, hold on. They're no. not doing enough? We had they not, so, so we thought it was appropriate that when we found, saw the decrease, look, there are a lot of reasons that aid cannot make it in. Some of them can be intentional. Some of them can be unintentional. Some of them can be bureaucratic, either inside Israel Israel system or inside the UN system. Some can be uh, the effect of criminal looters, who obviously the government of Israel does not control and is not responsible for. And so given all of those different factors that can go into the result that we saw, and the result that we saw was aid coming down 50, more than 50% from its peak, we made clear that, look, on the things that you can control, on the things that the government of Israel can control, recognizing that you don't control everything, we want to see steps. And at the end of those steps, we will come back and, and talk about what the results have been. Just one final thing on northern Gaza. When you were answering, uh, I think, Shannon, you talked about this endless cycle that the Israeli military seems to be in right now. So is the U.S. calling for, is the U.S. calling the Israeli military to wrap up, to finish what it's doing in northern Gaza now? We want to find a durable end to the war. And I say the durable end of the war is important, uh, an important, um, uh, important way to think about it. We have not called on Israel to just withdraw from Gaza and leave a vacuum there, because a vacuum actually doesn't help the Palestinian people, who would be once again living pretty immediately under Hamas's tyranny and would be potentially subject to the same jeopardy that Hamas has put them in for the past year by launching terrorist attacks against Israel. And it certainly wouldn't solve Israel's security problem. It would potentially land us back in the same place um, months or a few years down the road. And so that's why we're, we are working uh, to restart talks, which happened over the weekend, to try to find a, a durable end to the war. It's why we're working on the plans for what follows the war with our partners. Oh, actually, just reading the final one. On, on this uh, special channel or like uh, mechanism to talk about civilian harm in incidents, um, you said you're still talking. Um, can you explain like why it hasn't been set up? I, I don't have any more to read out today. It's an ongoing discussion between us and the government of Israel, and I just don't have any. So when you say that you raised it with the, you raised this particular incident of today uh, with the children uh, killed. Yes. You raised it with the U.S. We ra the gover the the United States raised it directly with the government. Who was the ambassador? I'm not going to get into who, but okay. it, was, it was conversations Thanks. from our government to theirs. Now, sorry, sorry, sorry to have. Can I ask a quick off-topic question? Yeah. From China, um, foreign influence operations. We've talked about Russia and Iran, kind of ramping up foreign influence operations ahead of the election. Friday, Saturday, there was new reporting that the Chinese or Chinese linked Chinese government linked officials managed to hack the audio of a senior Trump campaign advisor's cell phone. That was preceded by general reporting that they were trying to get access to data for the former president and Senator Vance and unnamed folks on the Kamala Harris campaign. Is I guess, is this something that you are tracking with chi with regards to China especially and are you addressing it diplomatically at all or are you just leaving it all up to the FBI to investigate? So I'm not going to speak to the specific incident because it is appropriate for the FBI and the, and the intelligence community to speak to any specific incidents when it comes to um, uh, 
such influence operations or such potential espionage operations across any wide, you know, uh, uh, wide variety of, uh, of incidents. Uh, I will say that we have raised consistently with the government of China um, at the secretary's level and at other levels the fact that we are watching very closely any attempts to hack U.S. systems, U.S. equipment, U.S. personnel to interfere in U.S. elections or other U.S. Uh, entities or uh, events and that we would certainly hold them accountable for any such actions. Beyond just the um, hacking portion of it, is it, ha is it fair to say that you've seen an increase in Chinese influence operations here generally? I, uh, you know, in yeah, I would, um, I would defer to the intelligence community to speak to that. As you know, the State Department um, has the mandate from Congress to track influence operations conducted by foreign governments overseas but when it comes to influence operations that foreign governments conduct inside the United States. Uh, it's a matter for the intelligence community and the FBI. And so I would defer to them. At one, and I'd have to go back and look at previous transcripts. I don't remember off the top of my head, but at one point you had said, or kind of indicated that. Um, now you're hoping I can remember what I said. No, I don't think you have to. <laughs> Basically, I just want to know if this, it, at one point you had indicated that Chinese influence efforts targeting US officials, not even related to the election, just in general, were sort of, I don't know if they were more sophisticated, but they surpassed the efforts of the other countries. Would you still describe, like they were more aggressive, would you still describe that as the status quo? I don't remember that comment, although I, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not disputing it. I just don't remember that at all. Um, but I would, I, I do, again, think it'd be more appropriate for me to d defer to the intelligence communities and to law enforcement to speak to that. So, so it's not, is it fair, oh, sorry. sorry, it's fair to say you don't really address that. It's just not, not yeah, it's not the, it's not that on the, on the, look. Uh, so when it c comes to making assessments about what's happening inside the United States and monitoring what's happening inside the United States, the intelligence community and law enforcement does that work. Now, when there is something that rises to a level of concern that needs to be addressed directly with the Chinese government, we do address it, address it directly with the Chinese government. And we have, over many number of months, made clear directly to Chinese officials our concerns about this type of behavior and the potential for this type of behavior and the fact that we would take it very seriously. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. And just back to um, Israel and Palestinian uh, territories. The, um, there's another deadline coming up for Israel's finance minister uh, um, to sign off on whether the uh, Palestinian Israeli banks can engage in correspondence um, there's concern uh, from the US and also the G7 members and apparently a, a letter was sent to Netanyahu um, expressing concern that this that Smotrich won't sign off on extending uh, uh, that cooperation and that it could potentially collapse the Palestinian economy. How uh, real is this concern from the US and can you um, give us guidance on what the US would do if he decided not to go ahead and explain um, that. We have been extremely concerned about this. You will recall, of course, that this is not the first time we faced this possibility. Uh, several months ago, um, there were uh, that particular minister made threats that he would not extend this um, particular provision, and we made clear to the government of Israel that there uh, that such an action would have severe consequences for the Palestinian economy. It would have severe consequences for Israel's security. Uh, it would potentially um, uh, cause enormous disruption in the West Bank. And that's not in the Palestinians' interest and it's not in Israel's interest. And we were able to uh, impress upon the government of Israel the incredible incredibly harmful nature of such an action the last time they got up to such a deadline and convinced them to extend it and we're continuing to impress upon them the same thing this time. Um, I don't want to deal with a hypothetical about what would happen if they didn't extend this provision. It's important that they do. Yeah, Saeed. Thank you, Matt. Uh, going back to UNRWA, I mean, you know, I, I went to UNRWA schools for a while. My wife went to UNRWA schools all her life and she depended on UNRWA ration. It is a major part of sustaining the Palestinians in every way. And, you know, trying to, you know, sort of satanize and, uh, UNRWA and say that it's, it has done some evil things and so on, 
goes back before this war. It goes back to 20, 2017 when they stopped the hunt. My question to you, you said that you know you are deeply troubled by the decision. And you also said that you engage the, Isra the Israelis. What steps will the United States take to ensure that UNRWA continues to operate? Uh, I'm not going to preview anything from here today, Saeed. If you look at the letter that the Secretary sa sent, he made clear that we are were opposed to the passage of this legislation, and he made clear that there could be legal and policy implications to the implementation of that, that legislation. That remains true. Okay, but you see, because you said that we want to see uh, that uh, aid is properly uh, allowed into the Palestinian areas and so on. But we, we're not talking about UNRWA. UNRWA is basically, if UNRWA is compromised, the, the whole aid for the Palestinians, uh, and in fact, the whole you know, uh, the real connection with what's going on in the world community, it, it stops. You know, it, it is totally compromised. I'm saying that, would you, let's say, agree to if uh, UNHCR, for instance, takes over uh, the aid uh, to the uh, Palestinians? Sorry, I can't get into a hypothetical. Okay. Uh, All right, let me, let me ask you a couple more questions, if you allow me. Uh, now, you, you said that, uh, at one point, I, I think you said that if, uh, if, if there's a vacuum, then uh, Hamas would return and, and the Palestinians will be under the tyranny uh, of Hamas again. So is the war, the purpose of the war is really to free the Palestinians from Hamas tyranny? The, the purpose of the war from Israel's perspective, and I'm just gonna t say what they have said publicly, that the purpose of the war was to ensure that Israel, I'm sorry, to ensure that Hamas could not repeat this attack again, to hold its leadership accountable, they have done both of those things, and to return the hostages. They have completed two very, pretty significant uh, objectives. They've also decimated the Hamas, Hamas's military capabilities. And so what the secretary impressed upon them last week was that it is time to find a way to bring this war to an end. Now, we have also made clear, and this is, a, uh, well, say we have also made clear that Hamas cannot continue to govern Gaza the way it did before October 7th, because you saw the result of Hamas governance of Gaza, and that is horrific consequences for the Israeli people and horrific consequences for the Palestinian people. But you know, seeing what, I, I don't know, I mean, some they call it a war. It's not a war. There is no opposing army. It is really a slaughter that, so, that we have Sa every day. I, and I don't want to enter into Palestine. Saeed, is, is the stipulation that there are no Hamas fighters left in, left in fighters. who are still shooting at the IDF soldiers? Yes, because I quote there are Hamas. Well, so okay, so like that's before you rename before you rename the conflict or re, re you know, let's let's have fact let's just establish facts about what is actually happening. Honestly, what we see day after day is a slaughter. It is a slaughter. I think there there will come a time when you guys have to call it exactly what it is because every day you know I asked this question several weeks back uh, about you know Palestinians get up every day you know, for another hundred dead, for another hundred dead. And this keeps going on. There is no end in sight. It doesn't seem that Israel has any incentive to basically indulge even in, in serious talks so, Saeed, about a ceasefire. Saeed, the horrific consequences of this war are exactly why we are trying to end it. The very things you just went through, and I would add to the suffering that's going on, the suffering of the hostages and the hostages' families, is for all those reasons that we're trying to end the war and trying to end the war in a, in a way that ensures peace and security for Israelis and Palestinians in the future. Okay. One last question on the aid. Now, the letter was sent out, I guess, around October 15th. So the deadline is November 15th? Uh, I think it was sent on November 13th. It was 15th. sent October 14th. It was 30 14th. days. There's 31 uh, days in October, so that might be November 13th. I don't know when you start the count, but there will be a lawyer somewhere in our building who could tell you the answer, the exact, the precise answer to that question. So on, on November 15th, we're going to say the deadline has passed and you have not done you have I'm not, not gonna, our I'm, standard. I'm not going to predict what we're going to do, but we made clear in the letter what the deadline was for implementing changes. Maybe, maybe you could bring that lawyer down to answer some questions to the podium, particularly about how you guys have not been able to come to any conclusion about whether what Israel is doing amounts to violations of international law. Well, there are any number of lawyers uh, in this building who are working on that question, but well, I know. Uh, for better or for worse, we'll it's my, for, it, for, be, for better for, for better for worse, it's my job to stand before you all and, and take questions every day. Sorry, when you say there are a number of lawyers in this building who are working on that question, the yeah. State Department lawyers are working on the question of whether or not Israeli military has violated international humanitarian law in Gaza or not. 
There are State Department lawyers course, working on of that. Of course, there are. That's something we've said a number of times. That there are a number of questions, a number of Using incidents. What process is that? Uh, I'm not going to get so, Hamara. You know the answer to this question because no, you, no hold like, on, just let me, just let me, let me, like hold, Hamara, let me, let me finish before. You know the answer to this question because you asked it uh, to me before, and I've answered it before. We have a number of ongoing processes to look at the facts of a number of incidents and to make specific. Assessments yes, but about I'm those incidents. Sure you didn't mention State Department lawyers of are looking at it. Of course, so like you said state, where we they, have state, ongoing so, processes. No. So the L Bureau is involved. So of in course, there are lawyers that. that, that hey, Mary, first let me just back up and say. There is very little that we do here that doesn't involve lawyers in one way or the other. But of course, when it comes to sure, making judgments sure. about international humanitarian law, of course, there are lawyers involved. They're not the only people involved, but yeah, of course. There and are. is this part of an atrocity determination I'm process? Get, I'm not going to get into the processes that we have. Can you way. say you don't have an atrocity uh, determination no, I'm not, as, process? As I have said to you before, I don't think it's appropriate for me to talk about the underlying processes that we have underway while they're ongoing. Go Tom. Uh, oh. Can I, go to Mich can I go to Michelle and then come back to Tom? Because I've seen you come in and out a few times. I have yeah, a feeling sorry, you need to file. So. Sorry if I, if I missed yeah. this, but the Knesset passed a, a bill today to bar the U.S. from reopening the consulate for Palestinians. And I wonder what you make of that. So I was not aware of the passage of that bill. I apologize. I'll have to take that back and get an, and get an answer. So apologize. Tom, go ahead. Maybe you could ask that same lawyer. I'm not sure. That's a policy question, not a legal one. So, <laughs> well, I don't know. It seems like a legal question. I, I'm not sure that the uh, Israeli Parliament can decide whether or not you guys are going to well, open. Well, maybe that will be a legal question. I'll have to. Them. Yeah. And, uh, Tom, go ahead. I wanted to follow up on Saeed's very first point there about UNRWA because we understand the immediate uh, critique that you have of the attempts to shutter it about the critical urgency of aid into Gaza and the effects on the West Bank and so on. But there is a deeper motivation for a lot of uh, Israeli politicians, um, especially nationalists, who want to break the link, the historical link between Palestinian re registered refugees of today and their historical dispossession in 1947, 1948, because that breaks the link between when three quarters of a million Palestinians fled their, uh, fled or were forced from their homes in of what is now Israel in 48 um, and the, the conflict today. So that's really important. And I just want to get a sense from you because I don't know if we've heard an answer to this question. Do you support those Palestinians continuing to have registered refugee status? So I can't speak to that today. I can tell you what we're focused on when it comes to UNRWA's work are the critical services that they provide. Um, uh, and they provide those services, as I said, in Gaza, in the West Bank, across the region, and it's critical that work to continue. Now, as to the broader question, uh, I can take that back and get you an answer. Okay, I mean, it's just important because you said- you Not here, I said, I'll take you back and get an answer. Okay. Um, on your own letter uh, of the 13th of October, you uh, warned in there you know, about the effects of um, legislation to, to ban UNRWA, uh, and you said to uh, Gallant and Derma, we ask that you take all possible steps, whether with lawmakers or using the authorities of the Prime Minister's office to, to ensure this doesn't come to pass. I mean, that part, it seems they've already clearly ignored because the vote has passed. So they've had two weeks to work with lawmakers to stop it. Are they they're not listening to you? The bill has passed, so... But you, you, you asked them to work with lawmakers to ensure this doesn't come to pass. So the, that, the, that part you've already lost on. The, the, yeah, I, so as I said before, the bill's passed and we've made quite clear our concerns and we will make our decisions um, in based on the next steps, based on the implementation of this law and based on any potential legal challenges. As I said, there's always when you have controversial laws that, that like this that pass, the potential for challenges that delay their implementation. I don't know if that will happen, but we're going to watch over the next few days to see. But I ask the question because does it give you any sense of how closely or how seriously they take your letter because I've already ignored that part. Well, we're going to see, right? Look, I'll tell you, we've heard the secretary speak to this. We've seen them uh, already take a number of steps that we called for and others they haven't taken yet. So we're going to make a, uh, we're going to look at the end of the 30 days and go through and see what they've implemented and what they haven't. So that, sorry, just uh, just let me go on this point because that's, that's your letter. In the March 28th ICJ order on the South Africa genocide case, um, in order 51-2A, I think it is, um, they say that Israel sh must take all necessary and effective measures to ensure without delay in full cooperation with the United Nations, the unhindered provision, you know, to allow aid to get into Gaza. I mean, in full cooperation with the United Nations or the country in question to then ban the primary UN agency that is responsible for that. 
does not seem like full cooperation. So you are, I will admit that I do not remember, I read that order when it came down, I do not have it in front of me and do not have the provision that you're, you're looking at um, to, to study, but we have made clear, I will say we've made clear, kind of in keeping with that order, precisely how important it is that UNRWA be allowed to continue. And even if you step back from UNRWA, that how important it is that Israel cooperate with all of the UN agencies that are operating on the ground inside Gaza to deliver food, water, medicine, and other humanitarian assistance. And it continues to be critical that they take those steps. But do you, I mean, uh, you talked about its importance, but this is a you know key organ of international humanitarian law that has made this order this year in the midst of this crisis. I mean, do you back that call by the ICJ? We want, we absolutely want to see humanitarian assistance get in. We want to see it get in through the other UN partners, and we want to see it get in uh, through UNRWA. And just finally, um, on the, this airstrike in Betlehia you referenced, um, you talked about, you know, this, the, the war's gone on for a year. Uh, getting here came at great cost to civilians in Gaza, often the case when civilians are caught in the crossfire of conflict. And I know, you, you know, you've used that phrase many times before. Is that a specific reference to this airstrike? Do you see this as crossfire? No, I, as I, I also said, as you notice, if you would note my full quote, said, we don't know what happened in this strike. We don't know the particular circumstances. So no, it was about the broader conflict. When it comes to this particular strike, we have reached out to the government of Israel for information, made clear we want to know exactly what happened, how you could have a result that produces, uh, according to reports, dozens of children dead, and we don't don't yet know the answer to that question. I just raise it because it is an expression you've used and sectors used many times about crossfire, including, you know, when there have been many civilian casualties and airstrikes. I mean, the Palestinians do not have air defenses. So I'm just sort of puzzled about this use of the phrase crossfire. So I think it should be pretty clear. First of all, when uh, I, I made clear it was about the broader I conflict. And in the, hold on, just saying, in well. the broader conflict, you do have <laughs> Hamas leadership. Hamas battalions who locate themselves under civilian buildings and fire at Israeli forces from civilian buildings. Now, just to, just to say, there are something, and that that's crossfire, right? You have times when there are um, uh, airstrikes that Israel carries out because they know that Hamas is located there. Um, there are times they carry out airstrikes because they have IDF soldiers on the ground who are coming under fire from a particular location, and this is a standard military practice, obviously, and they call in an airstrike to take out that location because they have soldiers who are under fire from there. That's the definition of crossfire, I think. It just isn't it a bit disingenuous, though, because crossfire would be understood to mean if civilians are caught in crossfire, you would understand that usually to be an accident on the ground because people are literally caught in crossfire. But using it to describe airstrikes when many, many civilians are killed feels misleading. I, I think crossfire means civilians caught between one military striking a terrorist organization or another military or a terrorist organization striking a military, and that is what is happening in, in these incidents. Yeah, Abby. Uh, you said earlier, and, and this is a hypothetical, but I'm starting with your own hypothetical, if this UNRWA legislation was implemented. A hypothetical so, on a hypothetical. Well, uh, following on yours, if this UNRWA legislation is implemented, just digging down on that, um, you've described them as irreplaceable, that there's no alternative. So it, at that point, would you assess that Israel is directly or indirectly impeding the delivery uh, of humanitarian I, I really can't predict what kind of an assessment we will make in the future. I made clear our concerns over it, and I made clear we're going to watch over the coming days what happens with the implementation of this law, but where we will land, I'm, I'm not going to forecast today. And then there are some reports from earlier this week that uh, the IDF detained medical staff within one of the largest hospitals in northern Gaza. Uh, the UN said yesterday that they left two doctors to take care of hundreds of patients. Is the US uh, asking Israel about what led them to detain those medical staff? And are you satisfied with their answer? We are asking. I don't have an answer yet. Okay. Yeah. Are you concerned about? Certainly, we would be concerned about the reports of doctors being detained if it prevented doctors from, if there was no reasonable basis for that detention and it was preventing them from in, in carrying out critical Life-saving work, absolutely, we would be concerned about that. But as always, we want to establish the actual facts, and we're looking into okay. it and asking the government of Israel for more information. Jenny. Thank you, Matt. A uh, couple of occasions on Russia and North Korea, 
and I will follow up, if I may. North Korea's foreign minister went to uh, Russia to discuss uh, additional dispatch of North Korean troops. And the uh, Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, claimed that the dispatch of North Korean troops was legally justified under the Russia and the North Korea mutual military treaty. Do you think that the dispatch of North Korean troops to help Russia's illegal war is a violation of international law? Uh, uh, we do. We believe that Russia's training of DPRK soldiers involving arms or related material is a direct violation of Security Council Resolution 1718, 1874, and 2270. And DPRK soldiers providing or receiving any training or other assistance related to the use of ballistic missiles or other arms would violate Resolutions 1718, 1874, and 2070, in addition to Russia and the DPRK's ongoing UN arms embargo violations. And one more, uh, the UN Security Council meeting on the North Korea's military deployment will be held tomorrow. As you know, sanctions in the Security Council will be difficult to do to opposition from China and Russia. Recently, the United States and South Korea and Japan and their allies have established a mutual, uh, I mean, multilateral sanctions system against mm -hmm. North Korea. Can sanctions on military cooperation between Russia and North Korea be implemented through this system? So the multilateral sanctions monitoring team is a mechanism for examination, analysis, and public reporting on the implementation of UN sanctions measures against the DPRK. It's not a sanctions imposing uh, mechanism itself, but of course we do maintain the ability to impose sanctions on both Russia and North Korea. We've shown we're willing to use those uh, abilities and authorities in the past, and we will continue to do so when appropriate. Does the United, the United States delegation to visit Ukraine because South Korea already visited NATO and Ukraine? So, so we have do you have any we have US delegations who are traveling to to Ukraine virtually every week. I don't have one to announce today, but it's quite regular for uh to, or to see US officials visiting Ukraine. The Secretary of Defense was there uh last week. Secretary Blinken was there last month and we will have uh, a number of important visits coming uh, in the coming days. Um uh, the uh, chief of staff to Ukraine's president is here today, meeting with Secretary Blinken and others from the United States, from the uh, U.S. government. Thank you. Um, so there are multiple reports saying that the new appointed uh, head of Hezbollah is in Iran. Um, given that uh, Israelis have started as soon as the announcement came officially uh, about his appointment, that they're going to take him out. Uh, is U.S. concerned that? Uh, Israeli taking him out in Iran will intensify the situation in the region, especially uh, with the Iranians saying that they are preparing for attack on Israel. I, I don't want to comment on a hypothetical uh, action in any way. Okay, and I have another one uh, regarding uh, comments by Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield today. Mm -hmm. um, she said that the United States made clear to Prime Minister Netanyahu that one year into the conflict, Israel must address catastrophic humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The United States rejects any Israeli efforts to starve Palestinians in Jabalia or elsewhere, and that Israel's word must be matched by action on the ground. Right now, that is not happening. This must change immediately. So can we take this to mean that the U.S. is acknowledging that there are Israeli efforts to starve Palestinians? And how should we take uh, see this in the context of the mid-October letter sent by Secretaries Austin and Blinken. I don't think that's the way you should take it. I think you should take it to be consistent with the letter that the uh, Secretary uh, Blinken and Secretary Austin sent, where they made quite clear that we're concerned about the humanitarian situation. You heard me address yesterday, we're particularly concerned about the humanitarian situation in Jabalia, where food isn't getting in right now, and water isn't getting in right now. And that does need to change. And that's what uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield was making clear in those remarks. Can we stay on the Lebanon part yeah. of that just for a second? I mean, there are multiple reports coming out of both Beirut and out of Israel that um, the U.S. has proposed some kind of a, a ceasefire plan for Lebanon that would um, call for a 
full implementation of UNSCR 1701 with the withdrawals by both Hezbollah and Israel uh, within two months. Is that at all your understanding of where So I don't want to get into the private diplomatic conversations that we're having, including about what any potential timetables might be. Uh, but we have been making clear in those conversations that we want to see, uh, as part of a diplomatic resolution, the full implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701. And that means uh, Hezbollah withdrawing north of the Tani River. It means Israel ultimately withdrawing uh, south of the Blue Line. And it means peace and stability. And what we're working on to get to that point are ways to bolster the Lebanese armed forces to ensure that they can provide security and they can provide stability in southern Lebanon. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, I'll give a move back to Iraq and Ukraine again. <clears throat> in the case of uh, Chang Shichama, you tweeted about uh, uh, Iran murdering a uh, U.S. person, a uh, California resident. Um, you know, some of us have been covering this case. Uh, you told us for months that you will be judging the Islamic Republic by their action. Well, this is their action. Yeah, and I think we've made quite clear what we think about this action as we've made quite clear what we think about previous actions that the Iranian government uh, has taken. And you've seen us, since the outset of this administration, impose more than 700 sanctions on Iran and Iran entities for a number of actions, including their human rights violations against their own people. We condemn the execution of German-Iranian dual citizen uh, Jamshid Sharmad, which reminds us once again of the brutal brutality and repression that characterizes uh, the Iranian regime. We offer our sincere condolences to his loved ones. We have been in touch with them to express those condolences directly. This is the latest abhorrent act by Iran following the transnational repression it committed when it abducted him. It also un under underscores the record pace of unjust executions in Iran continues unabated despite Iran's attempts to promote a gentler fa face to the international community. So we are in touch with the German government. We are in touch with the European Union and our other allies, and we will continue to stand with them in holding the Iranian regime accountable for its brutal human rights abuses. You told us in the past that you believe that Iranian supreme leader is in charge of decision-making process. So by refusing to you know, sanction him in the past, in the case and other cases, do you think you're actually creating an atmosphere in which he's acting in a... Alex, we, I just went through the litany of sanctions that we have imposed on Iran. And I'll remind you that we have worked with other entities around the world to impose sanctions on Iran. If you look at what happened in just the last month, you saw our European allies step up for the first time and impose sanctions on Iran Air, which will have real impl uh, implications for that airline's ability to operate flights between Iran and European destinations. So uh, I will make no apologies for our efforts to hold Iran accountable for its behavior. Thank you. On Ukraine, you uh, spoke about the Yermak meeting. I, I know I say you might not get, want to get ahead of the you know, uh, meeting. But, um, but here's uh, a question uh, about it. Uh, two questions, actually. <laughs> here's a question to get ahead of the meeting. There are reports that... He met with Jake earlier. He's meeting with the secretary. Yeah, that meeting, the meeting with the secretary. Right. Well, I apologize for not putting out a statement about a meeting that hasn't happened yet here at the, How much the is department. The issue of North Korea, you know, <laughs> supplying, uh, you know, uh, the, the troops to, uh, for Russia to fight in Ukraine will be the, to the subject. Uh, certainly, that would be one of the topics. That and the they, report they that the U.S. will not impose restrictions in future if that is the case. Can you confirm that this is actually? In, I'm not. I'm not going to comment on those reports. Uh, well, let me. Let me. It, uh, it, Alex, that was like that was four or five. I got to move on. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the Department of Justice indicted an Indian agent uh, for a murder plot uh, against a Sikh human rights lawyer in New York. You told us that U.S. wants to see meaningful accountability by the Modi government, but that agent uh, still has not been arrested. So what are the next steps? Is U.S. seeking his extradition? So that's a matter I would refer you to the Justice Department on when it comes to a question of extradition. That, of course, is a legal matter. We always defer to DOJ to speak to extradition. Um, but I will tell you that we have been in dialogue with the government of India about this matter. Of course, they sent uh, a delegation here two weeks ago to uh, directly brief U.S. government officials on the status of their investigation, and we briefed them on the status of our investigation, and we made clear in that meeting what we will continue to make clear, that it is important there be real accountability. Sir, after the killing of Sikh leader Hadith Singh Nijar in Canada, up by Indian agents, Canadian authorities expelled all Indian agents serving in the uh, Indian High Commission. And there are some unconfirmed reports that same action took place here in Washington, D.C. Could you confirm or deny State Department expelled the Indian agents serving in High Commission here in D.C.? 
that what? that we what, what I'm not ref, I'm not I'm, hold, I'm not I'm not familiar with this report that we expelled Indian diplomats. Yeah, no. Indian agents though, who are serving here in. Uh, no, I'm not aware of any such yeah. expulsion. No, yeah. Ryan. Go. Yeah, and then we'll go to Ryan. Sorry, Ryan. I'll cover it. Just just briefly. I know it was a few days ago, but uh, India and China. Um, I don't know if the State Department has commented on that. Uh, India and China said that they're working to resolve their border roll through, in, in potentially through joint patrols, was reached in, during the BRICS summit. Does the U.S. have any comment on that? Does, has the U.S. had any indirect engagement on this? So we're closely following the developments. We understand that both countries have taken initial steps to withdraw troops from friction points along the line of actual control. We welcome uh, any reduction in tensions along the border. Does the U.S. has had the U.S. played any role in? No, we have area. talked to our Indian partners and been briefed on it, but we did not play any role in this uh, in this resolution. Go ahead, Ryan. Thank you. So you commented earlier on how the letter that you guys sent in mid-October to Israel mentions the, you know, suggests that they not pass the UNRWA ban. Right above that, in that same letter, bullet point three of the three bullet points says that Israel should also end isolation of northern Gaza by reaffirming that there will be no Israeli government policy of forced evacuations of civilians from northern to southern Gaza, ensuring humanitarian organizations have continuous access to northern Gaza through northern crossings and from southern Gaza. Obviously, the 30 days isn't up, but two weeks ago, the situation in northern Gaza was bad. Like today, it's utterly dystopian. The, the opposite of making progress has happened there. Somebody mentioned the 109 civilians killed in this residential building as part of this forced evacuation. So it seems like neither of those two things have happened. And in fact, they've gone the opposite direction. Do you need the 30 days to make an assessment on at least that that bullet? So we have made, we have made clear that the situation in northern Gaza, which is what that bullet refers to, needs to change. And Secretary Blinken made clear directly to the prime minister last week that the situation in northern Gaza needs to change, that we need to see um, everyone in northern Gaza, every civilian in northern Gaza, have access to food and water and other humanitarian assistance. And we're going to continue to make that clear. You started with the RSF and the you know, most recent yeah. war crimes. UAE is one of the strongest backers of the RSF. You guys are very tight with the UAE. Like, why can't the U.S. pressure the UAE to put a stop to this? It's so just, we have how made long is this we be? have made clear to every country in the region, every country around the world, that no country should do anything to prolong this conflict, including providing arms to either of the warring parties. It just seems like countries in that region just aren't interested. Like they kind of, maybe they listen, but they just don't follow the advice that we're look. Every country, <laughs> every country makes its own decisions um, uh, on a, a host of foreign policy issues. But I can tell you that the thing that the secretary heard time and time again as we were in the region last week is that partner after partner welcomed our engagement because we are the only ones who could play this critical role of trying to end conflicts in Gaza, trying to end conflicts in Sudan. Um, they're difficult. Um, they're parties with. Uh, intensely competing interests in their own politics and their own situations. Um, but we heard over and over again that countries welcome the role that we play. Now, it doesn't mean they uh, every country follows exactly the course that we prescribe, but we continue to try and play the leadership role that we think this, the moment demands to try and bring countries together to find an end to these wars. Yeah, and just real quickly on yeah. Pakistan, I know you commented yesterday on the letter from 62 members of Congress. Uh, the Pakistan media is reporting that Pakistan security services responded to that letter by putting out dossiers of the members of Congress who signed that letter and flagging a particular number of them that were Jewish and a particular number of them that were supporters of LGBT rights in an effort to undermine the strength of that letter. Is, is there any level of kind of embarrassing conduct from that from the ISI or from the Pakistan military? that would cause the U.S. to kind of rethink so this relationship. So let me just say, obviously, that's something that would be concerning to us, but I haven't seen okay. that report yet. So before I offer a substantive comment on it, I want to take a look at the report myself and, and be able to um, to weigh in on it. And we'll get, either get you a written answer. I'm happy to come back and address it tomorrow from the podium. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. On Thursday's phone call between Secretary Blinken and Turkish Foreign Minister Hakan Fidan, can you please give me more details on what was discussed about specifically about Turkey's fight against terror, given that call came immediately after Turkey was hit by a terror attack. Yeah, so there were a number of things that the secretary and the foreign minister covered on the call. First of all, the um, secretary expressed the United States condolences for that attack and um, uh, uh, expressed our solidarity, solidarity 
with the Turkish people in the face of a terrorist attack. But then they also on the call addressed the work that the secretary had been doing in the region to bring the war in uh, Gaza to an end, to find a diplomatic resolution to the conflict uh, in Lebanon, to work to prevent the uh, situation between Israel and Iran from further escalating. Made that call, the secretary made that call while we were traveling from the region to London. So in addition to offering his condolences for the terrorist attack, he was updating the foreign minister on all the work that we did on all these fronts uh, uh, on, on which we uh, see Turkey as a critical partner. Uh, one more and then we'll wrap for today. Thank you, sir. Uh, two quick questions for you. First on UNRWA, you mentioned the U.S. playing the indispensable role of trying to end conflicts. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield brought up today that Israel and the U.N. need to uh, talk to each other, not at each other. There's this 90-day window now before the implementation. Does the U.S., while it's pressuring Israel, go to the U.N. and say, listen, you're not faultless here either. UNRWA has infiltrated, uh, been infiltrated by Hamas. It's time not for these cosmetic whitewash report changes but something really, really big here and try to meet halfway? Is, is there, is there so an opening for we, that? We have made quite clear that Hamas, or that, um, excuse me, we have made quite clear that UNRWA needs to undertake reforms. We have made quite clear that they need to investigate any allegations brought to them of misconduct by their employees. And we have seen them conduct in investigations and we have seen them dismiss a number of employees. Now, when you look at what is uh, look at further into this matter, you see that UNRWA has has said, and if the government of Israel wants to dispute this, they should dispute it publicly. UNRWA has said that with respect to a number of the allegations that Israel has made against UNRWA employees, when UNRWA has asked for the information from the government of Israel that they would need to investigate those claims, the government of Israel has refused to provide it. So yes, UNRWA absolutely needs to take allegations seriously. They need to investigate them. If there is anyone on their payroll who is involved in the terrorist attacks of October 7th, who is connected to Hamas, who is involved in terrorism in any, in any way. Those people need to be dismissed and UNRWA needs to look at, at reforms to ensure that such people are never hired again in the future. But the government of Israel also needs to provide information to UNRWA so it can carry out those investigations. The Secretary General mourned the loss of what he called a colleague, a colleague who carried out a massacre in southern Israel. It's one of those things that Israel kind of looks at and says, Something's not, not computing here, but I want to get to the second question. I know we're short. Um, Special Rapporteur for Palestinian Rights, Francesca Albanese, is in the U.S. She's going to give a presentation to the U.N., do a little speaking tour. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, Ambassador Taylor at the Human Rights Council, Ambassador Lipstadt have all deemed the Special Rapporteur in words or, you know, some phrase, a purveyor of anti-Semitism. I know you can't comment on individual visa issues, but in a broader perspective, we've seen countries deny entry to those who have made to have a history of anti-semitic comments is that taken into account at all in a broader perspective by the state department when it issues visas so i will just say that we have an obligation as the host country for the united nations um, we take that obligation very seriously and one of those obligations is to grant visas to any number of individuals with views with which we do not agree um, the Russian foreign minister travels to New York to participate in United Nations meetings. Um, that is our obligation as the host to, of the United Nations, and it's one that we take seriously. And with that, we're wrap oh, for today. Hey, yeah, do one more. I wanted to go to the, my two um, separate uh, individual people issues. The first on Iran, do you have more to say about the execution? yesterday of uh, the, the U.S. resident? I did. I did just a moment ago in response to... You did? Uh, yeah, in res yeah in res I did. Oh, I'm sorry. I completely I missed that. Clearly. I clearly. I, okay, and then in Cambodia. <laughs> um, so the report, I was trying the, to think of a... a the, I'll leave it at that. So I, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. I guess it just yeah. tuned out for a second. Uh, on Cambodia, the uh, journalist... I tune out to some of your questions, too, Matt. So. Clearly. <laughs> offense, you, offense not taken. You, 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 you can tell by the answers. <laughs> Um, the <laughs> Cambodian <laughs> journalist Nectar, I was released on bail last week, but there are uh, calls that charges against him um, are remain uh, in place. And I'm just wondering if you guys have anything to say about whether or not you think those charges are uh, so, valid or should be dropped. Let me just say that uh, this, I think this is the first time we've had a chance to address this uh, at the podium since he was released. So I'll say that, first of all, we welcome that Mekdara Dara was released. and. 
uh, is able to reunite with his family and we will continue to monitor his case closely. We raised his case at multiple levels in Cambodia and in Washington. We were one of many voices among governments, journalists, civil society representatives who expressed concern for his arrest and advocated for his release. And we will continue to monitor his case closely and call on Cambodia, Cambodian authorities to support a positive resolution for that case, ensuring that all of his rights are respected. Now, I don't know what the follow-up is going to be, so I'm just going to the, stop there and say, um, sometimes when it comes to sensitive diplomatic matters like this, we have found that it is better to say less and work harder privately, and that's, uh, this is one of those cases. So, and with that, with that, I'm going to wrap. With that, I'm going to wrap for today. Thanks.